Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. What gracious and generous and exaggerated comments. My sister and best friend, my sister Valerie, is here with me tonight. And uh, She's heard me say, if my mother, our mother and father were here, my mother would think you were talking about my brother, and uh, my father would think it was all true. Um, I want to thank everyone, and uh, thank you, Doctor, uh, uh, for, uh, and the Advisory Council for this honor. It is, uh, as Mike Carpenter, who was at the Defense Department, still works with me now at Penn, and was on the national security team with me knows this has been a, uh, a passion of mine. There are several things in my, turns out to be, longer career than I had anticipated that uh, I have uh, been very proud of. And there's nothing that I've been more proud of than my association with the effort to uh, end the genocide in Bosnia. Bosnia-Herzegovina. And uh, I know one of your honorees as well, I don't think he's able to be here tonight, one of my closest friends, uh, personal and political, and the other party, that we used to be friends, all Democrats and Republicans, is Bob Dole. But, uh, Back in 1991, as was pointed out, I was a much younger United States Senator, and I had been chairman of the uh, European Affairs Subcommittee for a long time. And uh, I had foolishly, in 1978, uh, written a report for, there was then a whole issue of Euro-communism, because local communist parties had won in a number of countries in Western Europe. And uh, there was a little hysteria in the United States about is, uh, is, is, is communism growing in Europe? And I was sent by then the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, a guy named Sparkman, uh, Chairman Sparkman, who succeeded William Fulbright, and uh, to write a report. And I came back and I wrote a report that a young Rhodes Scholar, uh, uh, a West Point graduate, urged me not to put in the record which predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse by 1990. And uh, I was imprudent then when I was younger. I'm much more prudent today. Uh, I was off by a year or so. Um, but uh, when, uh, when the wall came down and Europe began to, uh, uh, the former Soviet empire began to crumble, um, Yugoslavia uh, initially made some uh, rational and peaceful transitions. But I kept hearing reports uh, and reading about how what was going on in Bosnia Herzegovina and what was happening from coming out of Belgrade. So I started a, a series of hearings uh, and about what I heard and thought the abuses and the chaos that were unfolding in Bosnia Herzegovina prompted by Slobodan Milosevic. And uh, a number of my colleagues thought that I was being somewhat alarmist. And uh, at the time, I had been in the Senate a while, uh, and I was chairman of that committee, so I had the authority to continue to do that. But what happened was um, uh, I became convinced from those hearings and uh, from meeting with other diplomats from other parts of the world, that, uh, that Milosevic had a, uh, uh, literally a plan to ethnically cleanse uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
And uh, in 1991, an uh, aide of mine, a very talented guy named Jamie Rubin, asked whether I would meet with a young monk from uh, Medjugorje. And, uh, and he came, it was an unusual request. He came and wanted to talk to me, quote, as a fellow Catholic, which I've never advertised myself to be as a senator. So I saw this young monk, and he told me that what, he was, what was happening at the shrine, and he was worried it would be totally destroyed by Malocha, and he went through in great detail what he thought was happening, what he said what was happening, and uh, that how Milosevic was whooping up a frenzy. And I remember his famous speech on the 500th anniversary of Blackbird Field in March of 89, uh, when, he, uh, when he said uh, that uh, uh, he talked about how the Serbs continue to be maligned and put upon and victimized in Europe, and they're continuing to be victimized and whipping up a frenzy that was, uh, was underway. But no one paid much attention to it internationally when it occurred. No one paid much attention. And the more I got into it, uh, the more that uh, I realized that this is, uh, my sister and I were raised by what my, my Jewish friends would call a righteous Christian. At our dinner table was a place we, uh, we gathered to have conversation and incidentally eat. My father was an extremely well-read man. He did not go to college, and he was a student of history. And my father would talk to us about how he didn't understand why we didn't act more quickly, why Europe didn't act when the genocide began in, in Germany, when people knew it was happening, and how people could have actually met with Hitler and not called him for what he was, et cetera, and why we didn't bomb the rail, the rail stations and the railroad crossings uh, as the war was coming to an end. And uh, it made an impression on me and, and my sister and my brothers. And uh, I, I believe that the people of Bosnia had a right to defend themselves. So I introduced in March of 1992 a resolution calling for lifting the arms embargo that the United Nations, uh, that NATO had decided to impose, uh, and, uh, and it added another provision to lift the embargo and strike, to strike the, the JNA as they crossed the Drina to, uh, to do the the havoc they were undertaking in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it, it got nowhere. Um, I thought that the Owen plan at the time reminded me of a repetition of history in 1937 and 38. I thought I had a, some, uh, it was again, I was thought to be in, impertinent, although I had been a United States Senator for some time in my arguments with Lord Owen. and. Uh, why I thought the plan was just uh, a way to literally uh, dismember and, uh, and uh, allow the, uh, the ethnic cleansing of all of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Maybe I was wrong, but I believed it strongly. And, uh, uh, but again, my efforts to lift the embargo didn't, uh, didn't get much support, except for the Republican leader of the United States Senate, Bob Dole. And, uh, and in April of 1993, after I kept this up for now going on three years, two years, the ambassador from Belgrade came to see me um, at the direction of Milosevic, she said. And Milosevic wanted to see me to prove that he was not behind any of this, that this was just Serbs defending themselves against the genocidal actions of Muslims, Bosniaks, etc. And so I agreed to go. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I made that trip, uh, um, but I went first to Zagreb because I wanted to go into, uh, I wanted to go into uh, northern, uh, uh, northern Bosnia. Uh, and I remember taking a two-hour helicopter ride to Tuzla, where I met with Muslim refugees who were being cared for by Bosniaks who were fleeing from Srebrenica and coming north through the mountains. And there were a group of young Irish aid workers who were uh, there uh, tending to, and 
there was a school that was being used, the classrooms were being used to house and, 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 and feed and clothe and give shelter to, uh, to uh, uh, the fleeing folks from, from the South. And I remember I was being briefed by this young Irish aid worker who said, a truck's coming in now, a truck's coming in. Remember those UN big dump trucks the United Nations provided to help? And so I remember going out, even though it was April, it was cold still. And I remember going out and standing there and there was a dump truck that was packed with people, literally, I've told my children about, shoulder to shoulder, standing. It was completely packed, this big dump truck. And it stopped and the gate opened up in the back. And as people began to disembark, there was a dead four-year-old child who had suffocated in the middle. There was no way they were so packed, tightly packed as they carried the body out. The desperation of people escaping. The child slid down. There was no way to get the child up. I remember going into the schoolroom, meeting with a family, husband, wife, and three children. Children range in age, if my recollection is correct, about age five to 11 or 12. And they told me how they began to walk over the mountains going north. And his mother was with him, and it was cold. But his mother couldn't continue to walk. And he had to make a choice, leave his mother and save his children, or try to carry his mother and risk losing his children. And he said, my mother said to me through an interpreter, my mother said, I'm fine. Let me sit here on this rock. It's a beautiful view. And he said, I left her. I left her. After uh, these meetings, I, uh, I, uh, I traveled to Belgrade, where I remember I was in a hotel, and I met with uh, a group of people who were uh, then uh, allegedly the, the legitimate opposition, and they met with me in a large, about 30, 40 people in a large room in the hotel, telling me that uh, Mocha was a bad guy, but there really wasn't any genocide going on. And I had a young man with me, who's my committee, who spoke Serbo-Croatian. And we went up in the room, and there was a program on, I guess it was state-owned television. And the allegation was that Bosniaks were literally hanging Serbian children on meat hooks. And it actually showed this, I don't know if they were dolls or what, this, th this propaganda film to whip up the anger and enthusiasm that what was being done to the Serbs. They actually showed meat hooks, like when we, I come from a state that, where they call, that's the largest chicken producer in the United States, broiler chickens. And they call it hang a chicken. That's what they do, they hang it on a hook. From that, I went to meet with Milosevic. And I remember how beautiful the building was. An old Habsburg, I assume it was a Habsburg dynasty building. And I walked up these scarlet carpets up the main hallway and into his office. And I was surprised. I had read a great deal about him. But he was, as they say in the English vernacular, he was as smooth as silk. He spoke perfect English. He was a PhD. He was well-educated, well-mannered, welcomed me to his office. And his office, his desk was at the far end of like this room. And there were seating arrangements, but there was a small conference table at this end of the room as you walked in. 
And we went and sat at the table. He sat at one side, it wasn't a big table. And he had, I don't know who he had with him, but he had an aide with him. And I had three young, young men with me, about my age. Uh, this young man, Jamie Rubin, and a guy named Ted Kaufman, who became a United States Senator. And, uh, and I laid out my case as to what I thought was happening. And he insisted, although some of that was happening, it was just, it was just Serbs defending themselves, and he had nothing to do with it. And I talked about Radovan Karadzic. And he said, oh, I have nothing to do with Karadzic, nothing to do with him. And then, out of the blue, as if we were old friends, he said, would you like to speak with him? <laughs> My word. He picked up a phone, Serbo Croatian, call someone. And about 15 minutes later, I could hear coming up the steps, someone running up the steps that I had just walked up. And in walked Karadzic, that shock of hair that he had. And he sat down, red-faced, because he was obviously winded. And he said, I'm sorry I'm late. I looked at Milosevic and said, no influence. <laughs> Swear to God, true story. No influence. And the meeting went on, but did not end well. And he looked at me, and he said at the very end, very calmly, he said, what do you think of me, Senator? And I said, and I got widely criticized for it internationally, I said, I think you're a damn war criminal, and I'm going to spend the rest of my career seeing you're tried as one. It's all I could think about. All I could think about those stories dad would told. What would my father expect me to do in that circumstance? After the meeting, it was as if we had, as to use a slang expression in English, you know, when the people get yearbooks when they graduate from high school, and people will write, lots of luck in your senior year. It was like he looked at me like, lots of luck in your senior year, you know? as if nothing had happened, and we walked out. And uh, what happened was uh, we ended up in a circumstance where uh, I began to see clearly, and I had seen in my trip in the North, that uh, with the world was desperately, desperately trying not to see. You know, there is the expression, will the willing suspension of disbelief. Well, there was a willing suspension of disbelief. The next day, I tried to fly into Sarajevo on a UN aircraft, on a UN cargo plane. And there was a French platoon going in. And uh, I remember the colonel was a woman, very, very tough. And she was speaking to her troops in French as we tried to land. And I remember the colonel with me, an American, said, you need a helmet. I said, what do I need a helmet for? He said, you need it to sit on, because we're going to be fired at as we land in the airport. And uh, we were unable to land the first time because there was too much gunfire. And we finally were able to land. And as you all know too well, uh, what I found. I met in a bunker at the airport underneath the, uh, underneath the terminal with Izabekovic and Harris Salajic. And uh, they gave me their perspective of what was happening at the time of the siege of Sarajevo. I remember them talking to me about Sniper Alley, and the young colonel with me saying, we can't go in. And I said, we have to go in. No one shot at us. It turned out we didn't get shot at. But the Sniper Alley, some of you remember, was from the airport into Sarajevo. 
And I remember going into Sarajevo and what I found. The siege had been long underway. Most of the home building had been bombed out. It looked like my image of what uh, um, uh, you know uh, Eastern Germany looked like at the end of World War II. And I remember meeting with the editor of the newspaper and two stories down in the basement of the newspaper. They were still trying to write. They were still trying to print. They were still trying to keep it going. And uh, I, uh, I got, uh, and we rode through the city and so many bombed out homes, families that had been living together side by side in peace for a long time. I remember a neighborhood, I think it was in the south, or excuse me, the north, East, I'm not positive of that, it was on a hill. And I remember going up with, they introducing me to people on the street and said, you know, we saw the cars come. We knew they were coming for us. And we ran out the back of our house, this couple I met, with all our valuables. And our neighbor, I'll never forget the phrase she used, our neighbor who we used to have beers with was in the backyard and said, give me all your valuables. She said, we lived next to them for 22 years. Give me all your valuables. The time to leave, it was too dangerous for us to be able to go back through the airport. So we drove up into the mountains where the ski, where the Olympics had taken place to get a US helicopter at the top of the mountain, I forget the little town. I remember going through a beautiful little village. And what most Americans don't know is how lovely the homes were. They all had the clay roofs on them and they were usually white and they picture windows and nice yards. You'd ride along and you'd see a home that was perfectly manicured. Then you'd see a chimney, nothing but a chimney. And then there'd be two more homes or three more homes and then a vacant lot that had been blown up. And the neighbors that had me stop tell me that neighbors would come out and plant bombs on our houses. And shortly after I got back from this trip in March of 93, I invited Harris Solages to come and testify before the closed hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I found him one of the most articulate, compelling people I've ever had as a witness. He had a calm and a grace about him that was impressed everyone. And after the hearing was over, when I, I held it in the executive room of the Foreign Relations Committee, not the big hearing room, the big table, and I invited the senior members of the Senate, members of this Foreign Relations Committee, the Armed Services Committee, and the Intelligence Committee. And some of the really good men, half Republicans, half Democrats. And when he finished speaking, they started asking the question, said, if we lift the embargo, all we're gonna do is cause more death. If more people are armed, more people are gonna be shot, more people are gonna and I remember what Harris said. I think he had a daughter. I may be mistaken. I think it was a daughter. Maybe it was a daughter or a son. Son. He said, my family now is up in the mountains hiding right now. I'll never forget. He looked at one senator whose name I'll not mention. He's a good friend who was opposed to the lift. And he said, Senator, do me the honor of being able to choose how my son and wife will die. Let me make that decision. They're going to die. If you arm me, they may still die. But give us the honor of deciding how to die. I'll never, ever, ever forget that was one of the most profound things I've ever heard anyone say in real time. There was total silence in the hearing room. And we disbanded. But nothing happened. In June of 94, the next year, 
I convinced Bob Dole, it didn't take much convincing, to, uh, to go with me back to Sarajevo. And my wife, Jill, wanted to come as well and see. And Bob Dole's wife, Libby, who later became a senator, came as well. And we were going over for the 50th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. We started off in Anzio in Italy, where Bob had been wounded. And we stopped in Split on the way up and flew by helicopter up into Sarajevo. There was, as you'll remember at that time, a ceasefire. But what was happening was, as you'll remember, in the old city, which was mostly Muslim, there were snipers up in the mountains with high-powered rifles. Remember the scenes where I couldn't understand why in these windy streets in this old city there were, there were sheets and blankets that were strung across from house to house. It was to block the view of the snipers who were deliberately shooting children in order to try to intimidate the Muslim, the Bosniaks, to leave the old city. And I remember we went into a hospital. It was a ceasefire, as I said. And those of you who ever saw the movie, The English Patient, it reminded me of, of the hospital in Syria. It reminded me of the, of, the, of the movie, The English Patients. Washed walls that were as high as these walls unlike American hospitals that are 10 feet tall, old, it was clean, hardly anyone in the hospital. And the neurosurgeon said to me and to Bob, there's only a few people here, I want you to visit one. We walked into this pristine big room and almost, the, it looked like the bed was almost like it was starched linen. And this beautiful young raven-haired beauty with those hazel eyes you have, was lying there. She was 15 years old and just staring as we walked in the door. And as we walked in the door, she turned. It was clear she couldn't focus. And I shouldn't have, but I walked right up to the bed and held her hand. It was inappropriate, probably, to do it. It was my instinct as a father. I just held her hand. And Bob Dole stood at the base of the bed. He said, what's the matter? He said, the sniper bullet had gone through and severed the optic nerves. She's blind. You know, uh, I could go on, but the horrors don't need to be replayed of those years. You all understand them. The inexcusable delays the rationalization not to act. And every time the world failed to intervene, you lived it, you lost family, you lost homes, and you struggled to maintain your dignity. This was not a civil war, this was genocide plain and simple genocide. And it was unfolding before our eyes, all of Europe to see. And I believe, and believe then, that it was testing everything that we say we stand for. Everything that we say we stand for as Americans. The whole transatlantic community had taken up almost pro formo the phrase, never again. It was happening again, this time, Muslims. European Muslims. There wasn't nearly as much empathy or sympathy. Bosnia was the real first real test since World War II of our commitment of never again. Even after Srebrenica in 1995 and then Zeppa, it wasn't until those photos 
of young Bosnian men being put in boxcars. I had been talking about mass graves for the previous 14 months. No one wanted to listen. But when people saw that image, that, that forced them to no longer be able to rationalize. And things began to change. It was an image so reminiscent of the Holocaust that the truth could no longer be ignored. That occurred in July of 95. That same month, we were able to pass the resolution of lift and strike. NATO was embarrassed into following us because they had no choice once we made the decision to move. It was reminiscent. Remembering the start of today, the, celebrating the 25th anniversary of Bosnia's independence, Herzegovina's independence. But I think it's important to remember the start of that horrible war. Remember the tragedy that your people went through and remind the world. 100,000 dead, 2 million displaced, 20,000 mostly Muslim young girls and women raped because they were thought if they were raped they could never be part of their religion and their families again. We've celebrated the progress we've made in rebuilding your homeland. It was made possible by peace and the successful lives each of you have created for yourselves and your families here in the United States. The first overseas trip, one of the first overseas trips I made as vice president because the president gave me authority to do what I thought I needed to do was back to Sarajevo. I went because I wanted to make it clear that the commitment between the United States and the people of Bosnia Herzegovina didn't stop with the Dayton Accords. It's a commitment that goes beyond the cooperation between our governments and that thanks to all of you and your families and to thousands of proud Bosnian Americans all across this land, hopefully we'll be endure. We're still working together to realize a brighter tomorrow, one where every single child in the region has an opportunity to grow up in peace and security, regardless of their ethnic backgrounds. But I don't want to be too somber here because, but I do think it's important to remind people why this war happened, what happened, and how it can happen again. You know, uh, we're still working together. But I believe that all the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina have to continue to fight for the future that you thought you accomplished at the end of the genocide. Precisely because you do remember the past. You should remind your children of the past. Everyone should know the past. You've made enormous sacrifices, all for one purpose, to live in a peaceful and necessarily multi-ethnic democracy. And as proud as I am to receive this award, I must tell you there's a great deal of work that still needs to be done. There's real regression occurring in the region. That's why I went back 18 months ago to meet with the presidents of all the region. I've been concerned for some time. The people of Bosnia have endured too much to go back. And just remind yourselves, remind everyone home 
the path, what the path of populism and nationalism and xenophobia leads to. Division, turmoil, conflict, and the worst of all circumstances, sometimes genocide. Completing the unfinished business of a Europe whole and free and at peace is how all the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina are going to be able to flourish for the next generation and generations beyond. So when the politicians seek to exploit the pain of the past by spreading hate and scapegoating the other, you all have to stand up and reject the rhetoric of division of succession and reaffirm the positive vision a unified, multi-ethnic Bosnia-Herzegovina, democratic Bosnia with strong institutions, a Bosnia fully integrated into Europe. That's the vision that I know I fought for starting 27, 28 years ago that you, many of you, and your friends gave your lives for. And it's one that I think we have to continue to fight. So thank you again for this recognition that exceeds anything that I have done. But one thing I know, one thing I know, failing to remember increases exponentially the prospect of it being repeated. So make your voices heard. You've given so much. And by the way, you've given so much to the United States of America as well. I'm indebted to you. I'm proud to be associated with you. And the courage of your families is something I doubt I'll ever see again in my life. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.